What makes this an ideal location for a water mill is the River Beeler. Now as far as we are concerned, we've checked back in records and since records began, the river here has never dried up. We make sure it's an I makes it an ideal location for a water mill. In fact, during uh, the periods that we're talking about, at one particular point in history, there have been three or four water mills down this river. It actually, actually has a natural weir situated outside here, uh, has a, a 21 foot drop, and the water that comes into the mill comes down a wooden launder and hits the water wheel around about two o'clock, then drives the water wheel. It roughly takes about a thousand litres of water per revolution of the wheel to turn all the other gears and equipment. It also powers all of the ancillary equipment on the milling floor, as well as obviously the millstones. It's hard to believe that milling actually existed on this site for over 900 years. Now, if you can imagine that those early mills must have been very small cottage type affairs, with probably just one millstone in the middle, with a very little water wheel that powered the, the, the stones. What happened over those decades and tens of years was demand grew and mills grew up to what you, f you see today. So you'd have started off with a, a very small cottage 900 years ago and you would have come eventually to what we have today, which was built about 1740, which would have been grown up from that type of thing. We're now in the drying kiln or the drying room of the mill, as it's often referred to. This is actually where the, pro the milling process starts. In mills in the northern counties, as people probably know from this area, we have a, a damper moisture atmosphere. And so the grain has to be dried first before it's processed. What happened here was, ground marker on the wall, there was a trap door below that. The grain was then poured into this room, spread all over these tiles. Now this iron frame would have been covered with these clay tiles. Below here, a, fi a small fire would have been lit and the grain would have been very slowly dried. It would only take a matter of a, a few hours to dry, or well, a few tons. And what used to happen at night when the mill was finished was they used to put ashes over the fire down below, put the last load on of the day, so when he came next morning, he would rake the ashes in the fire and this load would be ready to take off first thing in the morning. Once it was dried to the right temperature, and you probably heard of the saying, the miller's thumb, that's where that comes in. What actually happened was the miller would pick the grain and he could tell by feel whether that grain was right or not. When it was right, when all the moisture was taken out, or a large percentage of the moisture was taken out, it was swept off this floor down to two trap doors. This is roughly the, the second part of the process. Originally, we're in the room just above here, stood on the floor. Uh, this is where the grain comes off, into the hoppers, it then goes into the sacks. The other thing to realise down here is the, the actual fire. The size of the fire in relation to the size of the kiln room floor. It's a very small fire, they didn't really need that much heat. One of the important factors about that fire is it had to have smokeless fuel. Obviously it didn't want any smoke contaminating the grain, it would make it smelly and horrible. So what they used was, they used coke from local gas factories that were around at that time. You can buy the equivalent now with smokeless fuel, but I very much doubt you would buy stuff this size or this light. That actually fueled the fire and it was stored underneath the hoppers. Following on from the, that last process from the uh, hoppers, the sack's brought over here, a hoist comes down, the sack is simply hooked on, the hoist takes the sack to the very top floor, there to remain until needed for being processed. Right, so we've seen now the mechanism in the basement, the way the wheel to wheel goes. Now we'll look at all the labour that the mill has put in, the actual end results that is achieved. It's quite simple really, when you've seen all the mechanism, very simple, and this is where the end product comes out. It may be worth remembering actually that in this mill's lifetime, up to about 
just after the Second World War to around about 1955, the actual end product here was, in fact, animal feed. As well as being a milling site for over 900 years, it would also have been an integral part of village life for over 900 years. Going back those many years, people from the village would have come here, uh, your housewives, your bakers, your shoemakers, your candlestick makers, vicars, lord of the manors, they would have all come here to have their grain processed. It, all, it became as important as the church. This mill is actually older than some parts of the village is. And all sorts of gossip would have been picked up about what the Lord of the Manor was up to, what the vicar was up to, what Mr. Jones down the street was up to. It all would have been come here. It would have been grown, expanded, extended to what it is today. Um, from a very small cottage of fur 900 years ago to this magnificent sort of building a few hundred years later.